Good morning, everyone, ambassadors, uh, minister, guests. You're all very welcome to this um, event at the IIEA on generally on the topic of enlargement, which is back on the agenda with perhaps some renewed vigor, the agenda of the European Union for the period ahead, uh, as indicated indeed in the, the recent strategic agenda. We're very um, honored to have with us today the Deputy Prime Minister and Foreign Minister of Moldova, Mihail um, Popoš, and um, he will address us in, in a few moments before I introduce him. Uh, just the usual indications about the um, the, the derouement of the event. Um, it is sponsored by the Department of Foreign Affairs under its um, Future Proofing Europe uh, program. Um, it is uh, not only uh, live here, but also uh, on the web. Um, for those of you that would like to ask questions here, all you have to do is raise your hand and a roving mic will be, uh, will be brought to you. For those following the event on the uh, internet, um, you use the Q&A function on Zoom to, to pose a question, and I hope that they will arrive here on the uh, iPad that I have in front of me. Um, both the presentation by the minister and the Q&A will be on the record, um, and the event will also be, uh, you can respond to the event as well on Twitter using the handle at ii. E A. Um, Minister Poposhi is the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Foreign Affairs of uh, the Republic of Moldova. He has a doctorate in political studies from the University of Milan from 2019 to 2024. He was Deputy Speaker of the Parliament and Faction Leader of the Action on Solidarity Party. He also served as a Vice President of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe in 2022. And his extensive parliamentary work includes co-chairing the Parliamentary Committee on Moldova EU Association and the Moldova Poland Parliamentary Committee. Um, his address today will cover both the preparation in uh, Moldova for accession to the European Union now that the uh, talks to the, the formal negotiations uh, to progress accession began at the very end of June, as well as uh, addressing some of the uh, nefarious effects, if I can put it that way, of Moldova's being almost on the front line in a very, in the, in the most serious conflict in Europe since the Second World War uh, between Russia and Ukraine. Um, in Ukraine, with which Moldova has a very long border, and I'm sure um, the minister will want to update us on the spillover effects of that on uh, uh, on the country and on um, the the progress of the accession negotiations as well. So, Minister, without further ado, I'll uh, give you the floor. Uh, I understand you'll address us for about fifteen or twenty minutes, and then we will go to question and answer. Minister Popoš. Thank you, Your Excellencies, dear friends. It is a special honor for me to be for the first time in Ireland, the wonderful, hospitable, and generous home for so many hardworking and law-abiding Moldovans. And I discover them literally every day, yesterday and today, on the streets, in the hotel, uh, who are contributing to the, to the economy of Ireland and who are making a good name for themselves, but also for the Republic of Moldova, given their uh, constant contribution. I'm also particularly pleased given the wonderful political relationship that we have with Ireland, and the fact that I follow here within a week, the president of the Republic of Moldova is a testament to how close our uh, relations are. And this relationship is manifest in the constant support that Ireland has provided to the Republic of Moldova in the context of uh, my country's EU accession process, but also in the aftermath of the Russian aggression against Ukraine, the support of the people of Ireland, of the leadership has been constant. And this support has allowed the Republic of Moldova to continuously 
be able to support Ukraine. We always say that any and every support that Ukraine receives, it's a support for the Republic of Moldova and the other way around. Every support that we get makes us stronger and better prepared to continuously support our friends and neighbors in, in Ukraine. And indeed, the Republic of Moldova has welcomed by far the largest number of refugees per capita in a country of barely two and a half million people who welcomed through the Republic of Moldova, about a million and a half of Ukrainian refugees. We currently host about 115,000 of women and children, and we have provided full access to labor market, education, healthcare, temporary protection measures, because we know full well that Ukraine defends us as much as they defend themselves. Ukraine defends the international rule-based order. Ukraine defends with the blood of the servicemen and women and the, the civilians that get attacked constantly, including the most recent barbaric attack on the hospital in Kyiv, where children struggling with cancer, including before the war, kids from the Republic of Moldova would have been treated there on, on, on a regular basis. These barbaric attacks and all the others that, that happen daily on Ukrainian energy infrastructure of course, the repercussions are felt very strongly in, in the Republic of Moldova. But despite this enormous horror that we face day to day, Moldova now is more resilient and stronger than it was two, three years ago. Because we took action. We didn't just muddle through. We achieved meaningful progress in this past few years on areas that felt impossible to, to advance such as energy security. It felt for the past 30 years that Moldova has this umbilical cord connection with Gazprom, which was impossible to break. Well, it turns out it is possible if you have the political will and if you take national security and energy security seriously, then you can find solutions. And quite frankly, it is incredibly unfortunate that political leadership in Moldova, our predecessors, have kicked the can down the road for over a decade now and fail to implement, implement in time the third energy package of the European Energy Charter to unbundle the energy supply, because we've been dependent for as long as I can remember since Moldova's independence on one supplier, one transit, one distributor of gas. And that's not ideal. You don't need to have a PhD in security studies or economics to know a dependency on one supplier and one transit and one distributor is not a position where you want to find yourself in. Now we have diversified, we are buying gas on the international market. And at times, and that was evident in, in one of the purchases we made last year, we bought American LNG at a price that was lower than what the contract that we have with Gazprom would have, would have offered. And we buy it in the summer on the cheap, we store it, and we use it in winter. And you would think that it's a no-brainer that we should have been addressing a long time ago. Well, unfortunately, it wasn't the case, because as many of you probably know, who are more uh, astute uh, followers of developments in Moldova, there was a time where political leadership in Moldova not only didn't have an interest to diversify, they had an interest to maintain the dependency on Gazprom, because there are all sorts of corrupt schemes involved with energy supply, and all sorts of kickbacks and all sorts of shady schemes of uh, uh, profits being siphoned off to offshore companies. And that was the sad reality that we faced for a long time. Thankfully, a number of years ago, when we had a change of government in Moldova, which uh, uh, some of our friends uh, remember, when we used to have uh, two governments at the same time for about a week, uh, Moldova's democracy was tested then. And Moldovan people and their aspiration for democracy, for rule of law, for human rights, for a return to the European family of nations prevailed. And now, despite the enormous suffering and despite the barbaric aggression waged by the Russian Federation against our neighbor and friend Ukraine, Moldova manages to persevere despite all odds. Despite having lost several decades in the 90s, we missed the train when our friends and brothers in, in, in Romania uh, started the negotiations. The 2000s, when uh, our friends from the Western Balkans advanced, we lost all those opportunities. We had our own glimpse of hope in the uh, early 2010s 
only to be destroyed by again the corruption and the 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 uh, avarice by by the political leadership that destroyed that hope that so many Moldovan people had in the 2010s. It felt like Moldova was going in the right direction, only for that hope to be shattered by the billion dollar fraud and everything that followed. And they say that uh, people don't get second chances often. Well, countries get them even less often. Moldova now has this second chance, thanks again to the wisdom of the Moldovan people, to the determination of this uh, small young team that President Sandu put together that uh, our opponents back in the day didn't give much uh, credit. And that was our luck because they didn't take us seriously. The oligarch that was ruling the country with an iron fist, he disregarded this young team that was creating this grassroots movement for rule of law, for European integration, for combating corruption, led by a woman politician with no or, or financial backing other than small donations from our citizens. They didn't take us seriously. They, they called us hipsters, backpackers, because we would carry our laptops you know, on our backs. And that was our luck, because uh, had the oligarch taken us seriously, uh, he may not have allowed us to stand in elections. He did. We won in 2019. We defeated the oligarch. Then we defeated the Russian proxy uh, that was acting as uh, uh, oligarch's puppet in the, in the presidential office. We defeated him in 2020. Then we obtained the majority in parliament in 2021. And now we have another important test this year, presidential elections and EU referendum. And when I was telling my counterparts at the beginning of the year that we have an EU referendum, and that was weeks before we got the green light to start negotiations, my counterparts were asking, is it a bit early to have an EU referendum? And our explanation is simple. We want to show our citizens and the world the extent to which Moldovans are aware and want to indicate precisely where they want to be. Because we have been ripped apart from the European family of nations in the Second World War for no fault of our own. And ever since then, during the Soviet Union and throughout the 30 years of independence, we had this constant, constant tug of war, geopolitical tug of war. And we need to make up our mind. And our citizens have spoken loud and clear in the last uh, parliamentary election, presidential election. But we also want to enshrine it in our constitution the European trajectory of the Republic of Moldova. And we are confident, though I shouldn't be too confident because that's what I get from some of our voters, that they, they are sure that the referendum will pass, that they will sure the President Sandu will, will win. And when you have this overconfidence for voters, this sometimes doesn't end well. So we need to work hard every single day to, to work for every single vote, especially in the country like Moldova, where we have struggled uh, in this never-ending identity battles, uh, issues that the Kremlin has tried to use against the Republic of Moldova to divide us domestically, fostering and feeding these uh, uh, cleavages of uh, uh, language, of history, trying to divide us now along uh, Moldovans who are at home and Moldovans that are in the diaspora, Moldovans who are Romanian speakers and Russian speakers, trying to divide us between Moldovans and Ukrainian refugees. But thankfully, they have not been able to achieve any meaningful progress, although they keep on trying. With the amount of money that they are funneling into the country, with the uh, enormous avalanche of uh, all sorts of hybrid tactics that they are trying to employ to destabilize the situation, to undermine the legitimate craving of the Moldovan people, to be part of the European family of nations together with Romania, together with the Baltic states, with Poland, with Ireland. And it's, it's a tough battle. It's a, it's a constant struggle because Russian propaganda would make you believe that European Union is the Middle Ages, that the impact of the, of the accession is horrible. And it doesn't take a lot of effort, and we have had recently some, some clear evidence of taking some mayors from 
one of the most pro-Russian regions in Moldova and have them on a field trip to study visit to Poland, to some of the communities there. And they have had a coming to Jesus moment. Because it's one thing to be told on Russian propaganda that this decadent West, that the horrible economic conditions uh, in, in the Baltics and elsewhere. And when you come and see it, and it turns out that the economic conditions are incomparably better, not just with those that we have in the Republic of Moldova, because that might be understandable, but a lot better than what they have in Russia, where regions uh, outside Moscow and St. Petersburg, you would struggle to find uh, uh, infrastructure that you would think is basic in the 21st century, including lack of gas and electricity and uh, plumbing. But propaganda makes wonders. Because if our partners who are incredibly generous with the Republic of Moldova and have supported us throughout the, the, this uh, many years of, 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 of struggling, if 1 million euros is invested in infrastructure in Moldova and the Russians spend 10K on propaganda, more often than not, that 10K on propaganda can undo the good work of that 1 million invested in, in uh, uh, sewerage, in, in running water, in building a road or a school. So we need to be much more proactive and much more creative in how we communicate with our citizens. And that's what we try to do now. We try to engage in every, with every single citizen, including in, in the some of the more pro-Russian regions, because it's not their fault that they've been left by the Moldovan political elites on the sidelines of the Moldovan political system and they have not been helped to properly benefit from the Moldovan political debates, from the economic opportunities in the country, because they have not been helped to learn the national language. And it's only last year for the first time that we have provided resources from the budget to help our Russian speaking citizens to learn Romanian so that they can truly benefit from what the country has to offer. And we've been truly surprised, and maybe we shouldn't have been, that there were twice as many volunteers who signed up for these Romanian language courses than the money that we had budgeted. But we will continue to provide support to our citizens because it is this very feeling of alienation, this feeling of, of ghetto mentality that the Russians are exploiting, that they are weaponizing this perceived disenfranchisement of certain groups of citizens to the detriment of national unity and to the detriment of, of the strategic vision of our country to be part of the European Union. And we are making efforts because at the end of the day, if you talk to citizens, if you inform them, if you help them internalize the incredible generosity of European Union, of our friends in the United States, of our friends in, in, in Japan, and the free world generally, as President Sandu likes to say, if you help them internalize this support, then of course in time that makes a difference. But more often than not, we are faced with situations where some folks can drive on a road that was built with uh, uh, Turkish taxpayer money, uh, take their kids to a kindergarten that was rebuilt with Romanian taxpayer money, uh, go to, to school that was built with European Union funds, work in a small enterprise that was launched with some American assistance, but they end up uh, praying to Putin like the Lord and Savior because that was what propaganda has been telling them, that Russia has helped them when in fact the Kremlin has not given anything that Moldovans can be thankful for. In fact, everything that we have received from the Kremlin was only sorrow and despair and the Kremlin has kept the Republic of Moldova and all of its citizens, including Russian speakers, including those in the Transnistrian region, including those in Gagauzia, hostages to this uh, malign influence that the Kremlin has waged in our region for many, many years, trying to deny our sovereignty, trying to weaponize our neutrality status, which the Kremlin is the only ones constantly violating by virtue of maintaining troops and munitions in the Republic of Moldova, despite the clear manifest position of successive governments in Moldova to withdraw those troops and munitions. But thankfully, our citizens are getting increasingly more aware and we have taken action to curb 
Russian propaganda in Moldova. It has taken us a year of the war in domestic internal political debates. Should we shut down Russian propaganda in Moldova? Should we not? What our citizens are going to say? What our friends in Brussels and Strasbourg are going to say? And then when uh, uh, in December 22, I believe, uh, the European Union shut down uh, Russia today, we figured if it's good for European Union, it's good for us. So we, we, we uh, address that, but it will take years, if not decades, to mitigate the damage that propaganda has done to Moldovan citizens. But it's important to start, and it's important to have this constant engagement and discussion with our citizens. And that's what we're trying to do. In a public debate, in uh, public discussions, including in this all-important referendum that, that we have in October. Because that's what democracies do. You engage with your citizens, you have the hard, difficult debates, and you, you answer all the difficult questions that citizens may have. And ultimately, you give them the democratic choice, which folks in Russia don't have. And that's the irony of some of the uh, supporters of the so-called Russian world in Moldova still have this constant ambiguity because on the one hand it's the propaganda and on the other hand is the reality of the front line in Ukraine, the destruction of civilian lives and the destruction of cultural heritage and the killing and maiming of, of children and, and, and civilians on, on daily basis. So more and more people realize that the Russian world is only bringing destruction and suffering. And hopefully more and more Moldovans will become aware of that. But we can only thank the international community for the support to the Ukrainian people and to the Republic of Moldova to be able to withstand this, this avalanche, this malign influence that, that we face on a daily basis. And we are confident that with this support and with the support of our people, we will be able to persevere, we'll be able to prevail, and we'll be able ultimately to re return to the European family of nations and to be able to live in the community of prosperous, peaceful, loving countries that we are as well. And uh, we can only Thank you from the bottom of our hearts for the generous support of Ireland to the Republic of Moldova. And uh, we can tell you that you can continue to rely on us as a credible partner in the region, as a, as a country that wants to contribute to security and not be just a consumer of security, and to be a reliable member of the European Family of Nations. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, for that terrific introduction um, to the, the situation and your, your, your resilience is what comes through and your, um, your fight against not only um, uh, traditional forms of aggression, if I can put it that way, but the, uh, the hybrid types of threat that you face, particularly uh, you have emphasized the information and disinformation and uh, fraudulent or money-related um, interferences. Um, I, I, you also ended by praising the relations between our two countries. I'm, I'm delighted that this is your first visit to Dublin, and I should have recognized uh, when we were when we came in the, the two ambassadors, Ambassador Larissa Michelet, working here in Dublin from Moldova, and Brendan Ward, a former colleague of mine um, in Romania, but uh, non-resident ambassador to um, to Chisinau. Um, Perhaps I could ask the first question. Um, you, you spoke about the upcoming referendum and election combined. I think it's in October. And your sense uh, of the uh, mood of uh, people in, in Moldova. What, what is known of the mood of the population of uh, Transnistria? I mean, they presume they will not be voting in this referendum. But what is known about the, um, the feelings of people there, particularly given the very interesting point you made about bringing the mayors to visit Poland and seeing the reality uh, of, of life within the European Union. Um, Tiraspol is not that far from Chisinau. Does any of the, is there any spillover effect to put it that way of the uh, 
the positive experiences are of, of life in Moldova into the, uh, the Transnistrian area. Certainly there are, and the Transnistrian region, just in sheer numbers, in the last parliamentary election, the Transnistrian uh, uh, residents, citizens of the Republic of Moldova who reside in the Transnistrian region of the Republic of Moldova, they are allowed to vote and they will be voting in the referendum and in the presidential election. In the past parliamentary election, the party that I have the honor of representing got 14% among the citizens, uh, Moldovan citizens in mm -hmm. that region. And in the autonomous region of Gagauzia, we only got 4%. And in the autonomous region of Gagauzia, it's a constitutionally controlled territory of Moldova. And we could campaign there. In the Transnistrian region, we couldn't step foot. Mm -hmm. And we got more than three times the number of votes. Uh, so that tells you the, the, the mood, mm -hmm. at least in, in, in these numbers. But another, a number, another metric that is even more important, and it's just very fresh from, from this past week, because the previous number was about 70%, now it's 80%. That is the number, the percentage of exports of the Transnistrian region to the European Union. 80% of everything that is produced in the Transnistrian region of the Republic of Moldova is exported to the European Union. The rest of the Republic of Moldova is somewhat behind the Transnistrian region. Because we are exporting uh, about 70% and the Transnistrian region of Moldova, 80%. So that tells you the, the significant anchoring of the region in the European Union. And that's only understandable given the, the geopolitical reality that we face. And in fact, the region and the so-called leadership there, they were very keen to be anchored onto the European Union because at the end of the day, the business elite there, like business people everywhere, they know where it's better for them. They know that where you have a market where, first of all, uh, the purchasing power is a lot larger, but also you have business with, not, with no political strings attached. Mm -hmm. you, market access is not being used as a political tool and as a blackmail, as has been in the case of uh, the Russian market access for the Republic of Moldova. And not to mention the, the, the horror of the Russian world uh, in full display in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Even the more hardcore pro-Russian folks in the Transnistrian region, when they look at what's happening just a hand, couple hundred miles away from, from their community, mm -hmm. you'd be hard pressed not to reevaluate the reality. So on the one hand is the horror that, that Russia is waging on, on, on a daily basis in Ukraine. And on the other hand, you have the 80% exports in the European Union. You have now the opportunity of uh, starting negotiations uh, for when it comes to the single market access. And in 2014, when we signed the uh, association agreement and the deep and comprehensive free trade area, folks on the left bank in the Transnistrian region were very eager to have their interests represented in the Moldovan agreement with the European Union. And that was the case. And we expect now that there'll be even a stronger impetus for them to make sure that their interests are represented in, in light of this uh, incredible anchoring. So opportunities are out there and we are firmly convinced that the only solution to the Transnistrian issue is a peaceful solution. Mm -hmm. And in light of the enormous economic opportunities that arise from EU accession, which we are very open to sharing with all of our citizens, because unlike the Kremlin, who doesn't care for the Russians, Russian speakers, or even Russian citizens, in Ukraine, in Moldova, mm. we care for our citizens. Mm. Do they speak Romanian? Do they speak Russian? We care and we want them to benefit from every opportunity that we can get. And uh, in light of the energy diversification, there is less dependence. Mm -hmm. So the opportunities and the economic incentives are becoming more robust and we will not shy away from using those economic incentives for a peaceful reintegration. Very interesting, functional integration, thank you. Any questions from the floor? Oliver Grogan. Uh, thank you indeed, Minister. He's working. Uh, th thank you, Minister. Uh, your address, I think, was very enlightening. And um, I was very interested to hear your references to Transnistria. Um, and indeed, it, one should be very encouraged by the uh, I think the underlying sense of pragmatism, which is uh, which seems to be there, and a growing sense. Uh, but isn't it true that um, maybe uh, 
eyebrows were raised in the West when the authorities in Transnistria in February uh, called for uh, the protection of Russia. Uh, now, I know that uh, it's noted that uh, afterwards this declaration was uh, heavily qualified, but uh, what is your sense uh, behind uh, this declaration? Is it there? Are they trying to play both sides off at the same time? Uh, how how do you interpret it? Thank you. Well, there was a lot of fuss about that event, uh, and nothing really came out of it. Unfortunately, our friends in international media have made us a bit of a disservice because they uh, portrayed it as carrying a lot more risk than it actually did. And our intelligence and Ukrainian intelligence and the intelligence of our partners were telling us that nothing is going to come out of, of, of this event, and nothing did. But uh, the damage was done. The perception was that uh, there was something to it. It ended up with a declaration of that gathering asking for Russian support only to be edited. They themselves edited in an hour saying that they asked for Russian diplomatic support. Because even they realized that they didn't want to have any ambiguity about what kind of support they're asking. So... Uh, we have made sure that the situation in the Transnistrian region remains stable, and the folks on the ground also have an interest in the situation remaining stable. No rational person wants to see his or her community to be ravaged by instability. And there were some attempts uh, by the Kremlin to push folks in the Transnistrian region for some escalatory measures. There was this uh, uh, on the Russian so-called election day, uh, there was an explosion of a helicopter in the Transnistrian region that was long decommissioned. And to make a nice explosion, they had to add kerosene to the helicopter. They had to put the rotor back on because it was staying rotting there in the field. They had to put the rotor on and then hit it with a drone and make a nice explosion. The camera was perfectly positioned, very good quality. They should get an Oscar for cinematography. Uh, but other than that, there weren't any other uh, major attempts at, at escalation. And we have constant talks with the folks on the left back in the Transnistrian region because nobody has an interest in uh, causing any measure that would hurt our citizens. Whether they live in Tiraspol, in Bender, in Kishno, in Belts or Comrade, we want to make sure that our citizens can continue to benefit from peace, although peace is a strong word when you have... Uh, a, a war zone uh, to the extent to which uh, Europe hasn't seen since the Second World War, and it's only a couple hundred miles away. But at least in the Republic of Moldova, we can assure our citizens that we have absolutely no interest in any escalation, and the folks in the Transnistrian region know that. Ambassador. Thank you, Minister, and thank you for chairing. Um, before this meeting, we had a short discussion on Mo Moldova's preparations to join uh, the European Union. <clears throat> it's a very, very ambitious plan, uh, but I would appreciate if you perhaps can expand a bit more and tell us what stages and how do you see things developing? We have some form of time frame. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not sure if it's very, very ambitious, maybe just ambitious, uh, or perhaps even realistic. Uh, given Moldova being able to benefit from the European acquis being available in our national language in Romanian, that makes it a lot easier than having to translate the whole body of European law into another language. The fact that about half of Moldovan citizens, including myself, are full-fledged European citizens by virtue of having Romanian passport, that also helps. Uh, we just uh, joke sometimes that we need to legalize the real estate back home because the people are already with their uh, documents in order, full-fledged European citizens. The fact that the Republic of Moldova is relatively small, uh, we don't have uh, any major issue if you slightly put aside the Transnistrian conflict, which is difficult to put aside. But uh, we are working hard now to clarify our capacity gaps 
so that we can address them in time and be able to move full speed ahead with the negotiation process. And uh, again, thanks to the enormous support that we get from our partners in the European Union, including uh, Ireland, including uh, Malta, uh, including Hungary, we get uh, offers of expertise to help us advance better and faster on the negotiation process. And we will be reaching out to our partners to, to benefit from this expertise, short-term, long-term uh, experts to help us negotiate faster and better our accession. And uh, with that in line, that's the argument that it's not perhaps very ambitious, but it's just about realistic in light of the uh, very good political relations that we have. And we are very uh, happy to see now the new leadership uh, in European institutions shaping up. We have a trusted partnership with uh, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, with Roberta Metzola, with Kaya Kallas, with Prime Minister Costa. We, we have very uh, good partnership with political parties in European Parliament. When Moldova uh, was on the agenda and any resolution was on the floor, it always passed with over overwhelming support. So in light of this quasi-consensus in European Union, when it comes to Moldova, we don't see any major issue. And I must say that also in light of the Transnistrian discussion, we are thankful to our partners in Brussels and in member states that they don't make it a condition, the settlement of, of the conflict to the EU accession, although we understand that that needs to go hand in hand. Uh, the fact that our friends in Brussels uh, are saying that the, uh, the Cyprus precedent is there, although again, we don't count on the Cyprus precedent, but to not make it a condition deprives the Kremlin of leverage when it comes to our accession process. We know that we need to, to work on the settlement and we do uh, in light of the economic opportunities that arise, but the sheer fact that these are two separate uh, tracks uh, allows us more leeway and doesn't give uh, de facto, the Kremlin a veto power on our accession process. So the capacity is being addressed. The uh, political support is there. It's only a matter of us back home doing the heavy lifting. And we have the commitment to do that because ultimately we're not doing that uh, for the sake of European accession alone. Justice reform is perhaps even more important for the sake of Moldova's economic development. I will not be able to convince not just a Moldovan here in Dublin, to bring his or her hard-earned money to Moldova and invest. I would, be, I would struggle to convince a Moldovan at home to invest their money back home if I cannot guarantee them proper, independent, professional judiciary. If I can guarantee them in court, they are going to win if they are right and not if the other part pays more. So we understand that justice reform is a cornerstone of Moldova's future regardless of European accession. If it helps us join the European Union, beautiful. But ultimately, it's the cornerstone of Moldova's development. So we are fully aware of that. And that's, if you will, the political DNA of, of the party that I have the honor of representing and President Sandu's political agenda is justice reform and European integration. And they're intertwined. That's a very uh, interesting point because, I mean, we, we joined the European Union 50 years ago. The acquis was a very different and more compact uh, body of, of legislation. Um, it's more fluffy now. It's, it's much wider, and there are different emphases now within it, including which you've just touched upon, the, the whole rule of law chapter and its centrality to the process. Um, but a tremendous challenge for Ireland at the time in the, in the 70s was the adjustment in the economy. How could you say a little bit about uh, the challenges that you see in that area? Um, for Moldova to, uh, to I suppose, I'm not sure about the structure of your economy, but probably to remove the state more from the economy, I imagine, and also to um, uh, to, to standardize, of course, to European standards. Well, first of all, I must commend uh, the vision and the, the uh, hard work of the people of Ireland and the leadership, because in 50 years, uh, Ireland cannot be compared to what it was 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. The economic transformation, and that's true for Ireland, it's true for Poland, it's true for Romania, and we count on it being true soon enough for, for Moldova as well. Because that's a fact, that's not uh, up for debate whether the European Union 
helped Ireland or it helps Romania or it helps the, the, the countries in the Baltics and, and elsewhere, uh, unlike what the Russian propaganda would make you believe. In the Republic of Moldova nowadays, we are already a small open economy. We want to be a somewhat bigger open economy, mm -hmm. but we are very open. The challenges stemming from, from European accessions are lower, given that we have already for a decade now the deep and comprehensive free trade area. Mm -hmm. and most of our exports already go to the European Union. And we've been all working for over a decade to adjust our technical standards to those of the European Union. We still have a long way to go. There is no way to sugarcoat it. There is a lot of work to be done, but it's in a way nothing new. We mm -hmm. just need to carry on, perhaps intensify. Uh, of course, we might need some uh, provisions to see in some areas, perhaps we would need to take a, a bit longer time for adjustment, and some areas would be better prepared to, to go in faster. Mm -hmm. But the support of European Union has been there. The, the lifting of quotas last year, for instance, in some of the fruits and vegetables for Moldova have made Moldova a powerhouse when it comes to plums exports. We are a leader in Europe in plums. We are a big exporter in cherries. And uh, uh, call me biased, but those are the best uh, cherries <laughs> and plums you can have. Uh, not to mention the wine in Moldova. Uh, and speaking of uh, state-owned enterprises, they are fewer. And we are determined to, to uh, uh, have a smaller state uh, presence of the state in the economy. Mm -hmm. And we would be very eager to see more investors from Ireland, from any other countries in, in, in Europe and in the Euro-Atlantic community. Uh, to participate in, in uh, these uh, efforts uh, that we want to, to streamline and to modernize and to make the economy more efficient. Mm -hmm. But again, thanks to the constant support of the European Union, including the support to our producers to create more added value so that we don't export the, the raw material, the fruits, uh, but process them add, and, add have, value. Mm -hmm. and have a higher added value, uh, invest more in technology sector. We have a vibrant ITC sector now and we are trying to 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 continuously diversify because the overwhelming perception back home is that moldova is an agricultural country well if you look at the numbers of the economic statistics that's not exactly the case because the it sector is contributing enormously the services sector the banking sector the pharmaceuticals uh but we need to uh, have more added value in the agricultural sector so that we can benefit from for instance the ecological products niche in the european union that we could be very competitive because in some areas uh, because of our economic challenges we didn't have a lot of money to to use on pesticides so we 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 have a lot uh, uh, better uh, agricultural uh, products <laughs> and, and we try to 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 find that niche that we can uh, occupy and one of the silver linings in the Russian embargo on Moldovan wines that started uh, in the mid 2000s, long time ago, uh, was that our wine sector has performed and transformed since then to the point that we are now producing less wine, slightly less wine than we used to produce 15 years ago. But we as a budget and the wine sector earns a lot more than before because the quality increased, the price is, is better, and we have a lot of boutique wineries that popped up with restaurants, with hotels, and this whole hospitality industry has been transformed. And uh, you can ask uh, uh, the, the uh, prime minister of Ireland who visited Moldova last year for the European Political Community Summit, mm -hmm. which was hosted by a very nice winery. Mm -hmm. uh, the famous the, sellers. The, the, the famous sellers. So that was a blessing in disguise. The, the, the Russian embargo on Moldovan agricultural produce and wine actually helped our wine industry transform. It wasn't pleasant, but at the end of the day, it was the external shock that we needed. And I'm not quite ready to thank the Russians for the energy crisis, <laughs> but the fact that we got pushed with our backs against the wall put us in a position to do the difficult job of diversification, which, as I mentioned, should have been done a long time ago. But, you know, the saying goes, better late than never. And quality rather than quantity. So that will be Definitely. excellent. And uh, 
quality over speed. That's another one that our friends in Brussels are telling us when it comes to reforms, and we totally agree. I have one question from a, a participant on the, the web. Tom Murphy asks, will Moldova remo remove neutrality from its constitution? And if so, when? That's a very tough discussion when it comes to the neutrality clause. On the one hand, it is clear that in the, uh, in the constitution, it was introduced in the early 90s as a way of hoping to shape the Russians into taking their troops and munitions from Moldova. Needless to say, it didn't work out. And ever since, the Russians have been the biggest promoters of Moldova's neutrality status, while being the only ones who have been violating it for the past 30 years, if that makes any sense. At the same time, Moldovans have grown accustomed to this very soothing idea of neutrality. You don't attack anybody, nobody attacks you, you don't have to spend on defense. Whereas at the same time, you don't have to have a PhD in history to know that uh, neutrality clause never stopped an aggressor. And Ukraine was de facto neutral, was a non-military bloc country, didn't stop the Russians, didn't stop Hitler or Benelux countries and, and uh, the plan to invade Switzerland was there. So the fact that the country is neutral and uh, aggressor when it gets to the border and it says on the border post there, neutral country, never works. So we need to have these discussions with our citizens. Again, in a democratic environment, you need to take your time to convince citizens to have the public debate about pros and cons mm -hmm. and to have a difficult discussion about uh, ways of ensuring national security of the country. And we should have this discussion. We're trying to have this discussion. And at the end of the day, Moldovans may be persuaded in, in, uh, in the future that neutrality is not a guarantee of security and some other opportunities must be explored. And it may as well be that in an aftermath of this robust debate, Moldovans will continue to believe that neutrality has value and it needs to stay. It's a matter for Moldovan citizens to decide, but we need to have this public discussion in light of the uh, security situation in our region. You would have to be blind not to see the risks. But again, in light of the constant Russian propaganda for 30 years, this idea was instilled in, in, in many Moldovan citizens that neutrality is a guarantee of security. Mm -hmm. And it will take time for Moldovan citizens to, uh, to have the realization that uh, citizens of Finland and Sweden have gotten a bit quicker than others. And uh, uh, again, I can understand Switzerland with this geography, uh, maybe uh, Austria, but in the case of Moldova, with our, our geography, it's uh, a bit trickier, diplomatically speaking. Understood. Question here, yes. Very much. Mulțumesc, domnule Popșoi, pentru prezentare. Uh, my name is Claudia Bodulescu. I'm Romanian, but very interested uh, in uh, in Moldova, and I, I do research uh, on on Moldova. I would have uh, three quick, short questions, if possible. Questions. One would be on. Uh, well, you mentioned um, Moldova's neutrality. Um, but also you mentioned in your presentation that Moldova doesn't want to be a consumer of, uh, you know, help to, to ensure its security, but wants to contribute to, the, to that as well. So I wonder if you do you take any measures to improve Moldova's military, um, you know, preparation in case of a uh, spillover of the war into, into Moldova. Another one would concern Moldova's uh, reforms, uh, uh, more specifically to align with European standards and more specifically with regards to public administration reform, uh, because I'd say it's it's still quite uh, uh, antiquated uh, given the, the communist uh, legacies, but also in terms of fighting corruption. And last, um, if uh, the referendum goes, you know, passes uh, and uh, Moldovans vote to join the EU, um, including in Transnistria, do you think Russia would allow that and uh, would say, okay, uh, go for it? Thank you. Well, let's start from, from your last question. Moldova is a sovereign country, no matter what the Kremlin believes. Mm -hmm. And it's the sovereign right of Moldovan citizens to decide their future. The Russians may not like it, but the Kremlin will have to live with it. So the stronger the message that Moldovans will send in this referendum, hopefully, the clearer it will be, including for the Kremlin, where Moldovans want to see their future. 
we don't have any illusions about how Moscow would react. They'll probably continue with the same efforts of, of trying to undermine us, but it's up to us to build our resilience to be able to better withstand those efforts. And in fact, we are always uh, emphasizing this, that it's in the interest of all of our friends and partners for us to be more resilient, to be able to defeat these hybrid tactics that the Russians are imposing in Moldova so that they are not successful and they are not being replicated and taken on the road to some of our other partners in the West. When it comes to public administration reform and combating corruption, that is a priority. We know that we need to modernize our public administration to be more competitive economically and to be more competitive within the European Union. Uh, but again, in light of the economic challenges, post-pandemic situation, high inflation with energy costs, aftermath of the Russian aggression in Ukraine, there is only so much that uh, you have only so much bandwidth when it mm -hmm. comes to, to reforms and justice reform, the biggest undertaking that we have. So we'll have to take it steady. We'll have to prepare our citizens. And we have now the voluntary amalgamation of communities, a reform that was very successful in Ukraine. And we're trying to learn from that experience. We provide incentives for small communities to merge, to be more competitive. Uh, and we'll continue to, to do that. And when it comes to combating corruption, we've improved 40 positions in the uh, Corruption Perception Index by Transparency International. We were 110th, something like that. Now we're 70 something in the world. Not a statistic that I'm particularly proud of, but the the uh, improvement is significant and we'll continue to work on, on, on improving the situation. When it comes to defense spending, we've almost doubled it. We have committed ourselves under the new national security strategy to reach 1% of GDP. Traditionally, it was about 0 0.3, 0 0.4. And uh, we know that we need to take our uh, defense more seriously. When it comes to contributing to security in the region, for the past 10 years, we've contributed to the K4 mission in Kosovo. We have just started our participation in the CSDP missions in Bosnia and in Somalia. Uh, we have participated in the UNIFIL mission in Lebanon, and we want to be more present because we want to contribute. And we want to make sure that our partners appreciate this support that we provide. And uh, we'll continue to, to have our servicemen and women uh, participate in missions because that helps with the inter interoperability with our arm armed forces, but we also need to invest more. And uh, uh, it doesn't help when your defense spending, even uh, that one, the doubled one, is lower than the four defenders of Real Madrid. <laughs> uh, so we need to work hard to make sure that uh, we take our defense spending a lot more seriously because uh, uh, independence and sovereignty costs, and uh, especially in such a troubled uh, environment that we find ourselves in. Thank you. One more question here from the front. Thanks. Well, as convener of the Ireland-Moldova uh, Interparliamentary Friendship Group, I just had to welcome you for the first time to Ireland. And I made my own first trip to Moldova on the 9th of May to join other conveners of friendship groups across the EU in support on Europe Day of your accession process. And within three weeks, I was back for a second trip with the Count Corla. So I've managed to visit quite a bit of Moldova um, twice in, within three weeks, and it's maybe we'll see you back here in three weeks. But certainly, uh, we now know that Moldova has ten flights a week from Dublin to Chisinau, so I think it is quite a uh, an important route, and, and we have so many of your citizens here. And in the context, I suppose I, I take your point, and I was the point I wanted to make was the stronger the message that comes, the better in terms of. 51% is a win, but 60, 70, 80, 90% would be better. And uh, just to pay tribute to your ambassador and, the, and the, the diplomatic team in Ireland who arrived here in 2019, 2020, um, with, with no building and with no present residence and with no nothing and really hit the ground running and have made a great impact here uh, in terms of making connections with the parliament and with the people uh, and with your own citizens. But you have a big diaspora. Um, the diaspora here and the diaspora in many other countries can see the benefits of EU membership uh, more obviously than people who are at home who can't yet see it. Maybe they see it if they go to Romania, they see it in other countries, but they're here all the time. They see the benefits. We've, we've spoken about the benefits to Ireland. Uh, I suppose, what can you do or what can we do uh, as parliamentarians here or as Irish people here 
to harness the diaspora here and in other countries to make sure that they get out to vote mm. uh, in big numbers and send a message back and also go back because many of them have residences back in Moldova and friends and family back in Moldova to convince them, no, this is really, the EU is not perfect. And we said this on our trip into Moldova, it's not perfect, but it's the only show in town. Mm. And it's it's really the only, mm. um, you know, we will all have our own little <laughs> quibbles with part of the organization or various bits of legislation, but it's been enormously beneficial to, I would say, every country that joined, but particularly Ireland uh, and whatever we can do to help you and whatever you can do to harness your diaspora, I would encourage. Thanks. Well, first and foremost, thank you very much for your personal commitment when it comes to the, our bilateral relations and parliamentary diplomacy. I, I'm a big believer in parliamentary diplomacy, having led those efforts in parliament for five years. And uh, you've said you've been twice to Moldova, don't stop. You're welcome to continue on that uh, there isn't uh, uh, a number that is uh, too high when it comes to the visits to the Republic of Moldova. Uh, we have a lot more wine cellars uh, other than those that you've already visited. Uh, uh, you, had, you have a head start compared to perhaps some other uh, friends in the audience, so you're all invited. The Republic of Moldova is uh, famously uh, this our proverbial hospitality. This is uh, well known and uh, we look forward to host uh, more and more of our friends because that's not only a, a show of political support, but al that also helps economically. The more wine you drink, the better. The, the uh, relationship that we have with Ireland is quite remarkable. The fact that we have so many hardworking uh, Moldovans here that are also supporting uh, families back home, it's a win-win. Of course, we count on them at a certain stage to come and invest in Moldova and to to help uh, Moldova advance on its European path, but uh, their participation in political processes back home is truly remarkable. I remember I gave you some of the st statistics of some of the regions that voted uh, in the previous election. Well, the diaspora voted about 85% in support of the party that have the honor of representing and in support of President Sandu. So the diaspora is overwhelmingly pro-European, about 90% in certain uh, regions and countries. So the fact that we have about 10, 15% of our citizens abroad, their contribution to the economic and the political development back, back home is difficult to underestimate. And we count on all of our citizens to be continuously active in uh, politics back home in Moldova, just like they are uh, in, in the economic activities here. And we'll continue to work to advance their interest be it with the conversion of driving licenses uh, here in, uh, in Ireland and in other parts, we just uh, uh, finalize the discussions with our friends in France, uh, be it on uh, social welfare agreements, uh, be it on uh, other important agreements on uh, protection of investments and cooperation in, in other fields. Uh, we try to make sure that we support our citizens, even those that are abroad because they have such an important contribution to the economic situation through remittances, through investments, but also to the political situation back home. Because ultimately they are, all of them are unofficial ambassadors, both abroad, but also when they come home and they share with the folks at home, the experience that they have gathered in the European Union. And when I talk to a voter, inevitably I will be perceived as biased. You know, you're a politician, you have an agenda, when a fellow family member who has lived and worked in Dublin, in Manchester, in, in, in uh, Hamburg, comes and tells his or her fe fellow family members or friends or neighbors their experience, then it resonates a lot closer and it has a, a bigger impact. So we count on our citizens to continuously being there for the country and for themselves, because the better and the, the, the more developed the country is economically, politically, the better ultimately it will be for them, for their families back home. So thank you for all your support and you're welcome back at your earliest convenience. Thank you, Minister Popshoi. Thank you very, very much for being such a, a, a wonderful and an informative um, guest uh, from, uh, you're a very far away country from Ireland in, in terms of geography, I think as far east as, as you can go from our westerly situation. But uh, I think from everything that is said here today, you're a lot closer uh, than that, Pol uh, politically, economically, indeed, and in terms of the 
very positive effect that the diaspora uh, effect has too. I'm, I'm genuinely inspired by the confidence you have shown and your mastery of the task that lies ahead of you, which is enormous. And I've, I've looked over the uh, accession framework that you have to now work your way through. But I think with the spirit that you've shown today and the assistance also that you are uh, getting both from the union and it's from its member states, you, you certainly um, deserve to succeed, as you said yourself and underlined, as a sovereign country. And we're not unaware that we too in the European Union have a great deal of preparation to do as well for this uh, complicated process of, of enlargement that is now looming for the Union. But thank you very much um, and every success in the work that you are uh, leading and steering in relation to the accession process. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.